I'm going to teach this morning uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but to begin with, I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. You know, last week we shared on water baptism one of the two ordinances of the New Testament church. Um, there are two ordinances that most Protestant churches observe. Ordinances comes from the Latin, which means that which is ordered or that which is commanded. And uh, your New Testament churches, churches like ours, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, whatever you want to call them, or Protestant type churches generally observe two ordinances, baptism, water baptism, and, and then uh, the Lord's Supper or communion. Uh, last week we dealt with water baptism and we baptized 11. Oh, and what a blessing that was. And uh, this week, even though we won't be having communion right after the, uh, the, the service, still I thought while I'm dealing with the ordinances, let's deal with the ordinance of communion because it's something we need to remind ourselves of frequently. I mean frequently, to keep it fresh in our minds because it's important. It's, it, it can't deteriorate into a mere ritual, nor can we uh, ascribe to it uh, some efficacy that it does not carry. It does not carry saving merit. You don't receive special graces or dispensations by receiving communion. Just like when you're water baptized, you don't get saved by water baptism. You don't get clean, you just get wet. However, because it is in obedience to a specific command of the Lord, He told us to do this. Matthew 28, Mark 16, we shared those passages last week. Uh, actually, there were three criteria an ordinance had to meet in order to be considered a divine ordinance that was established in the church and that the church is supposed to continue to practice. One of those criteria is that it had to be instituted by the Lord Himself. The Lord Himself has to institute it. It can't be something a man did, a preacher did, a pope, or a potentate, or whatever else. It had to be instituted by the Lord Himself. Second, it has to convey spiritual significance. There has to be something spiritual conveyed that is revealed in the practice, as in water baptism or communion. And the third criteria is that whatever this is, its perpetuation had to be commanded by the Lord Himself. In order for the church had to be commanded to continue to observe it, to continue to do this. That makes it an ordinance. Only two things meet that criteria, and that being water baptism and the other, the communion of the bread and cup, otherwise known as the Lord's Supper, known by many other names right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 16, it's called the cup of blessing. 1 Corinthians 10.13, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? So here it's called the cup of blessing. It's called communion, which means fellowship. It's called the bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So you've got a few different names for it right here. Uh, the communion, it's called down in verse 21, the same chapter, the Lord's table, when he says you can't drink of a cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, you cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. And then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll look at a couple of other passages. For instance, in verse 20, it's called the Lord's Supper. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, or as uh, Weymouth in his New Testament translation, he translates it, the Supper of the Lord. That is, the Supper belonging to the Lord. Is it not to eat the Supper belonging to the Lord, the Supper of the Lord? That is, the Supper instituted by him, the Lord's Supper. So communion, cup of blessing, uh, the 
the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. It's also referred to as the Last Supper. Uh, uh, Acts 2.42, it's, re it's, it's referred to as the breaking of bread. Uh, Roman Catholicism refers to it as the Eucharist, and it comes from the, the term they had, when he had given thanks, verse 24, 1 Corinthians 11, when he had given thanks, Eucharista. The uh, means to give thanks, they refer to it as the Eucharist. They, uh, of course, they make it a sacrament that conveys grace. Uh, but we ought to be grateful. It is to be a time of gratitude. All, all of our life is to be marked by gratitude and thanksgiving. But if you would, I would like for you to look with me at 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to read about the institution of the Lord's Supper, and we're going to look at a few key words, key words, in this passage uh, that define the meaning of it for us. Uh, you know, like baptism, the observance of the Lord's Supper is a doctrine, you could say an ordinance, that is full of controversy because many, many different groups do it different ways and some attach specific uh, graces to it as in Roman Catholicism or as in some of the other liturgical churches. Others see it as a memorial, a remembrance as the scriptures declare. Uh, and I could actually spend weeks dealing with the subject and but, but we're not, that's not our purpose today. Our purpose is to look at it and to understand why we do what we do and the significance of it. And uh, I'm going to try to do all of that in one message. So uh, we may look at a few verses of Scripture. If you'll come along with me to verse 17, that's where we start. Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not... That you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now, it would be real easy to spend a lot of time on some of these verses. You know, back in verse 2 of this chapter, Paul starts out praising uh, the, the church in Corinth. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I, as I delivered you. I've got this to say, i got this to praise you about. But Paul, when he gets to verse 17, he says, Now i got something I'm not praising you for at all. In fact, he says, when you come together... Now, when you come together, he's talking to the church. When the church comes together, you know what that's called? That's called church. <laughs> that's the assembly. The church is the assembly. When we come together, it's for mutual edification, instruction. We pray together. We pray one for another. We, we, we find out what's going on in different people's lives. We, we bear each other's burdens. We encourage one another. Uh, we get exhorted from the Word. We, we're taught. We're instructed. We're equipped. And we're sent forth to go out and spread what we know to others. We come back each, each week and we get our batteries charged again. We get spiritually rejuvenated. It's really important. The coming together of the body of Christ is extremely important. It builds you, strengthens you to go out there and face the world, the flesh, and the devil. None of us are so strong that we can do without it. You cannot just dismiss it as something unimportant or insignificant. I just be a Christian on my own. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. You remember all the analogies in the Bible that the Bible uses of each Christian. We're all parts one of another. We're all members of the body of Christ. Uh, your body has many different parts. No part lives alone. Take your kidney out, just sit it on the side. It's not going to do too well. If it's not attached to the rest of you, it's not going to do well. Well, so it is with the body of Christ, with the church, with the assembly. Each of us are members attached to each other. We're stronger than we are by ourselves. I draw strength from you, encouragement from you. You draw it from me. We draw it from one another. We pray for one another. We encourage each other. Verse 17 is powerful because Paul says when you guys come together... It's not for the better. It's for the worse. Now, what kind of an indictment is that? 
when you come together, when you guys assemble as a church, it does more harm than good, he says. Why? First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. I don't want to believe it, but there are these schisms. Now, he's addressed them on that matter before. I'm of Christ. I'm of Apollos. I'm of this. I'm of that one. Uh, there are fractions, divisions, contentions, and strife among you. This one fell out with that one. This one's promoting their little pet doctrine, and that one's disagreeing with it. And each one has their own self-interest at heart. For there must also be heresies among you, divisions, that those which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. When they come in, in the early church, he's referring to a practice. They attached a fellowship meal with communion. There was a fellowship meal. It's referred to in the Bible here in Corinthians as the agape meal, a love meal, a feast of love. We might refer to it today as a dinner on the grounds. <laughs> I hear some churches refer to it as potluck. Everybody bring a pot uh, full of something and we'll just open it up. We'll all eat together. A lot of times we'll do that after church. Sometimes uh, it's, it appeared in New Testament times. They probably did it before church, but before the communion at least, before the communion. So he says, you guys come together. Now, now here's the thing. You know, the early church was an eclectic uh, group, diverse, many different kinds of people. You know, people of different races, people from different social strata. There were those who were very, very poor. Many of the New Testament believers were, were slaves or former slaves. They had nothing. Others might have been rather wealthy. Others were merchants and so forth. So they were, there was a middle class, uh, uh, in the social ladder, there were some who had no money, there were some who had plenty of money. The idea was that in the church, in the assembly, we all gather and we're all equal. We're all equal in the sight of God because that blood of Christ was shed for every man, every woman, every nationality, every language, every race. The blood of Christ destroys every barrier, all such barriers. Christ died for Jew and Gentile. He died for male and female. The blood of Christ is supposed to erase all of those barriers. And in the church of Christ, something unique happened. And that is that the poor might sit right next to the rich. That, that didn't happen in ancient society. Everybody kept to their own class and their own caste. But in the church, you would have people of different nationalities. You might have a Jew right next to a Gentile. You might have an Ethiopian right next to an Italian. And together, they're worshiping the same Savior, the one who died for them all. Paul's rebuke is that when they came together, now, the rich, at their agape meals, the rich would bring food because everything was to be shared amongst all. The poor had very little to bring. But that's okay because those who had could bring extra so that everybody could eat. But then here's what was happening. They would bring plenty, but then rather than fellowshipping one with another, with the brother or the sister of a different social caste or a different race, they tended to segregate in little pockets so that you had a little handful of the wealthy over here and the impoverished over there, and the rich, the ones who brought the food, ate all the food so that the ones who had nothing left hungry. This is a powerful rebuke. He says, verse 21, For in eating everyone takes before other his own supper, one's hungry and others drunken. What? Don't you have your own houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. No, no. I'm not praising you for the way you act when you come together. Some are ignored. you got plenty of hugs and love for the one who's just like you. But no hugs and love for the one who's got skin of a different color. Or who comes from another caste. 
lower on the social strata? I believe this is a rebuke the church needs to hear today in uh, all over America and all over the world. He says, then beginning in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. This is We read this section every, every time we have communion. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together into condemnation. The rest will I, will I set in order when I come. Some would hover over the food and try and eat as much as they could. They're kind of like a dog, you know. You let a dog loose on the dish, he's going to eat it all. He's not thinking about what the other dogs are going to have to eat. He says, when you guys come together, don't think that you're coming together to gorge yourself. Wait for one another. Make sure that there's enough for everybody to eat. And if there's not enough, then you eat when you get home. There's some strong language here that, like I said, we could take quite a bit of time and deal with this, uh, this particular passage of Scripture. But what I would like to do today is just point out a few key words. And by those key words, I think we'll get a, a, a better understanding of what it is that the communion is supposed to be all about or the Lord's Supper is all about. The first word I want to... Uh, give you is the word revelation revelation now this revelation is not the book of revelation that's at the end of your bible but a revelation that the apostle paul received personally from the lord verse 23 look for i have received of the lord or from the lord that which also i delivered unto you I have received this from the Lord, he said. And then what he goes on to teach them, he got from the Lord by revelation. You know, when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, it's recorded in all the synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record it. Paul wasn't there. He wasn't even saved at that point. He didn't get saved over later in the book of Acts. A year, two, or more after the Lord's crucifixion and resurrection. So he wasn't there when the Lord <laughs> broke the bread at uh, when he was eating with his disciples at that last supper. And he passed the bread out and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Or when he passed the cup, he drank it. He said, this is the blood, the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. The, the Apostle Paul wasn't there. Not only was he not there, but he has specifically said in the Scriptures that the things he got, he didn't get them from the other apostles. He got them directly from the, uh, from the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about how he was caught up to heaven, into the paradise of God, into the third heaven, and given visions and revelations from the Lord. Amen. So... It was obviously there that the Lord not only revealed this 
profound uh, revelation to him. But Paul's the one who reveals to us that it is an ordinance, that it is a divine institution. And, and then he says, I receive this from the Lord, and what I receive from the Lord, that is what I delivered unto you. This I have by revelation. Amen. Second word that I would like for us to see today, a key word, is the word remembrance. 1 Corinthians 11, we see this in verse 24 and verse 25. The word remembrance. Verse 24, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it. In remembrance of me. In remembrance. To recall. To recollect. To remember. The new, uh, the international standard version says, keep doing this in memory of me. That's what remembrance means. In memory of. It's a memorial. Remembrance. It's a memorial. It's something to do to memorialize, to remember, to, to observe in memory of the Lord. Remember his sacrifice. Remember, he says, my body broken for you. Remember my blood shed for you. Remember my body broken in humiliation, broken in scourging, uh, in beatings, broken in uh, the piercings of the crown of thorns and the nails and the Roman spear. Remember, he says, this do... Now, now he's passing these, this bread. He passes this bread to them. He says, you eat this and you remember me. You remember me when you eat it. So there's, there's a special significance there. And the cup, you drink this. And when you do, you remember me. Every time you partake of it, you remember. Remember that I shed my blood. Remember that it's my blood that provides you access to God. Remember that it's my blood and my blood alone that purchased your redemption, that provides for your forgiveness. You remember. And here's a key, a couple of key words right here in verse 24 when he said, This is my body which is broken. <laughs> For you. For you. Aren't those key words? For you. Broken for you. The Lord specifically wants us to know that what he did was for you. Not in some vague way. Not in some general way. But in a very specific and personal way. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. For you. That's, that's a very key statement right there and every time we partake of the Lord's Supper wherever you partake of it wherever you are when you partake of it you remember that it costs the Lord everything you remember that he paid that price willingly and you remember that he paid that price for you make it personal for you because we must never forget every nation has its memorials every city has memorials every city of any size has memorials statues maybe of some great man a great leader a, a great statesman a spokesman or statue of a hero a, a war general or something like that you know every nation has them a plaque maybe somewhere to memorialize a, a significant event in the history of the city or the country 
right here in New Orleans, we have all kinds of memorials. Uh, our city is really not that old when you compare it to European cities, but it is old when it's compared to American cities. You know, we have a long history here. You walk around New Orleans uh, or drive around New Orleans, we have big memorials all over the place. But you know what happens to memorials? You tend to forget about them. They're there, but uh, you drive through Lee Circle. How many of you notice that there is a 60-foot pylon in the middle of that circle with a 12-foot statue of uh, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee? I mean, it's there. It's been standing there since the mid-1800s. But people don't think about it, talk about Lee Circle. You, you, you don't even see it anymore. It, you, just, you just drive around it without hardly paying any attention. Or uh, if you're in the French Quarter, you're walking around Jackson Square, there's a statue of, oh, Andrew Jackson on his horse, horse all raised up, 13-ton statue. Andrew Jackson, you know, the hero of the uh, uh, War of 1812. Well, wasn't fought here at the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. Helped defeat the British with a ragtag group of uh, American troops. Defeated a powerful British uh, army. But that's a memorial to a man who went on to become the seventh president of the United States. Uh, but we don't even hardly give it a second thought anymore. <laughs> Uh, our nation has some huge memorials because what they memorialize is thought to be so significant that they make it uh, more than a mere plaque or a statue like the Lincoln Memorial, uh, where they actually copied the ancient uh, temple of Zeus in Greece and built it just like that and put this gigantic statue of Abraham Lincoln in it. Uh, a significant leader, of course, in our American history, or the memorial walls on the National Mall where all the names of all of our fallen war heroes. Uh, you know, these memorials touch a lot of people. They'll go by, you see photographs all the time of a, a veteran soldier with his hand on that wall just weeping. Uh, Remembering, remembering fallen friends. Uh, memorials play an important place uh, in every society. One of the most moving memorials I have ever personally been to, well, well there's been two actually. One was the World War II Museum right here in New Orleans. If you haven't been there, you need to go. Uh, because we must not forget the sacrifices that so many made. That's right. Amen. But I'll tell you, I think the thing that brought me to my knees, and every time I think about it, it makes me want to cry, is the Holocaust Museum Amen. in memorial of six million plus Jews who were eradicated by the Nazi regime in World War II. Uh, Nothing I don't think I've ever seen compares quite to that. Uh, it, it's on a very peaceful, tranquil hillside overlooking the a panoramic view of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and the whole thing is a memorial. It's a memorial. They, they had to have spent an unimaginable amount of money to, to build this memorial. But it was so important that the Jewish nation did it. People gave from all over the world for that memorial because they said, we must remember. We must not forget. We must not forget that six million of us lost their lives while the world basically, passively, looked the other way. There is a hall in it, in a huge vaulted room. They call it the Hall of Names. Amen. And uh, you can't go in there without crying. No. But in the Hall of Names, there are the names of three million of those that died. I mean, they have done some painstaking research to find 
how many died during these terrible persecutions. They, they found the names of three million. They are still three million plus. They don't even know who they were. Their names are gone. They're just... But in this hall of names, the names of the dead are read all the time. Over and over and over. And this is what the nation of Israel says. We must not forget. That's what a memorial is for. So you don't forget. Amen. That's what the communion is to every single Christian. It is a memorial. It is so we never forget. It is not something empty or trite. It is not something that is merely a ritual or a rite. It is a remembrance where the Lord himself said, When you do this, you remember. You remember. It's a, there's a solemnity about it. Yet there is a, a thanksgiving about it. And yet at the same time, there's a celebration about it. Amen. Because what we remember is what bought our liberty. And just as those Jews are, said, are told repeatedly, we must never forget. That's why they have such eternal vigilance. They're surrounded by people who hate them. They must never forget. Well, we too must never forget that Christianity is about Christ. It's about Christ. It's about what He did. It's about His life, His perfection, who He is, God become man. It's about Christ. It's not about ritual. It's not merely showing up and doing your good deed for the week. And it's certainly not about you. It's about Christ. Let's remember it's about Christ. Lord, it's all about you. Lord, every time we take these elements, let us remember you, Lord. Let us never forget that this is not out about this is never about us. And our little hurt feelings, or this one didn't talk to us, or that one said something that offended me, or I don't like this about that church. It's always too hot in there, or it's too cold in there, <laughs> or whatever. In the Lord's Supper, we remember. We remember. We remember that He died for us. We remember why He died. This was done for you. It's for you. It's for you. And you know something else we remember? We remember that He's coming back. Now, this is important too, and that brings me to the next word. You know, the word revelation, the word remembrance. But the next word I want to point out is the word proclamation. I want you to look with me again to verse 26. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. You do show. The word means to proclaim. Every time you partake of these elements, when you take the Lord's Supper, this is itself a declaration of what Christ did and also a declaration that He's coming back. Notice, you do proclaim the Lord's death. You preach it. You proclaim it. You announce it. You herald it. That's what it means. You demonstrate it. You signify it until He comes. Yes, He came. He lived. He died, He rose, and He's coming back. He's coming back. And every one of His disciples is commanded to remember that. That when we take this, as often as we do it, it's interesting that He doesn't tell us how often to do it. We're not given that specific instruction. He doesn't say, do this every week. Do this every time you gather. 
He doesn't say do it once a month or do it bi-monthly or once a year or once a decade. He doesn't tell us how often to do it. He just says as often as you do it, you do it and you remember me. So it's left up to every congregation or if you're part of a denomination the denomination decides for you how often you're going to do it otherwise it's up to every individual congregation to determine how often they're going to do it there's no right or wrong answer there because some churches do it more often than others we do it once a month once a month now we could alter that do it twice a month two weeks in a row uh, it there is no sacred amount of times you're supposed to do it but here is what we we are supposed to do we're to do it often enough so that it remains this memorial in our minds in our hearts in our thinking in our comprehension and yet not so often that you can ignore it or trivialize it or begin to think it's just a ritual or you start Ignoring it altogether, like uh, the statue of Robert E. Lee over there in the middle of <laughs> Lee Circle. You see it without seeing it. Right. You pass around it and don't even know it's there anymore. Right. So often enough that it stays in our hearts and minds and thoughts. Amen. But not so often that it's just another, you know, another ritual or rite with no real significance. But here's what he says, that we're to live our life with the view that he died, and he died for me, and that he's going to one day split the heavens and return, and absolutely nothing is going to prevent him coming. Amen. Every time we receive the communion, we show forth, we proclaim, we declare, we preach and teach and speak of the Lord's death. That's what it is, a proclamation of his death. That's what these elements symbolize, his death. His body broken, his blood shed, until he comes, that is, until he returns. And he will return. He absolutely will return. So in the communion, we look back at what he did, and we look ahead, because he is coming again. Amen. And we don't want to ever forget that. So... That makes it a time of solemnity and yet expectation and rejoicing and, and thanksgiving. And that brings me to a ne the next word, and that is, it is a communion. Very significant word. We read it already, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Isn't this the communion of the bread uh, and the communion of the cup? It is a communion. The Greek word koinonia, it means fellowship. It is a communion. Communion always speaks of the same thing. It speaks of love. It speaks of intimacy. It speaks of fellowship in the purest form. In the purest form. Every time we partake of these elements, we're reminded of the very precious fellowship, the relationship that we have with Christ. And that, of course, is due purely to his sacrifice. But you know what? When we take these communion elements, we're also reminded of the communion, the fellowship that we have with one another. It's the fellowship of the body of Christ. We're the body. So there is to be a fellowship with one another, a fellowship of equals, a fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it's supposed to be a fellowship that ignores social standing, racial differences, nationalities. Hello. Well, I'm not going to fellowship with you. You, you live... Don't you live in that poor neighborhood? Oh. We have a blessed fellowship with the Savior, with the God of the universe, who has removed all barriers. 
uh, to his presence. Both Jew and Gentile are accepted by him. Black and white, rich and poor, male and female, all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that fellowship is pictured, depicted in the communion. It is a fellowship of the body of Christ. So when we come together, let's remember that. We're a fellowship. We're a church body. We're a family of brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, it's a rich and blessed and precious fellowship. It's the fellowship of our communion. Now, with that thought in mind, you remember how atrocious then it would be in the eyes of the Lord for the church to come together and instead of coming together they came apart they came together only to segregate into certain pockets or segments this group having no association with the other group one group feeling less welcome You know that is abominable in the eyes of the Lord because the communion, the communion of the bread and cup, Christ died for each and every one of us. We partake of these elements. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. That blood that was shed for me was shed for you. And for me to look down at another because they live in a different neighborhood, because they're a different nationality, It's abominable. This is a key word right here. Fellowship. When the communion of the church is no communion at all, no wonder Paul says, I, no, no, absolutely, I do not praise you for this. In fact, some had treated the church more like a social club where people of the right status, they could hang together and everybody else, you know, they looked down their nose at, you know, there was an elite group and everybody else was just beneath them. And that brings me to my next key word. And that's found right here in verse 27. 1 Corinthians 11:27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Amen. See that word, unworthily? In this unworthy manner, you, with all of your schism, division, strife, with all of your pride, with all of your self-righteousness, you are going to receive of the communion, the communion that makes us all one, all equal, all brothers and sisters. You receive it in that unworthy manner, that ungodly a manner, you might say. When we segregate from our own brothers and sisters in the same body because we're prejudiced, biased, bigoted, then we destroy this communion. In fact, the Lord uses even stronger language through the Apostle Paul when he says things like verse 18. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 18. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are these divisions, schisms, tear. It means to tear a garment, rips. There are divisions among you. I partly believe it. Verse 22, he talks about humiliating the brothers. What? Do you not have your own houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise? You show contempt? Do you despise or show contempt to the church of God, the body of Christ, and you shame them? You humiliate others. You embarrass them. You disdain them. You disgrace them by your pride, your arrogance, your haughtiness, your better-than-thou attitude. This is pretty strong language, don't you think? He says again, in the light of this context, you partake unworthily, verse 27. He says the same thing again down in verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily in this unworthy fashion, this irreverent fashion, 
which brings me to uh, some other key words that I like to consider in this passage. Words like guilty, verse 27. You are guilty. They shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Or how about words like damnation and judgment? When he says, let me just read this to you as well. Not only are they guilty, verse 27, but verse 29, He that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation or condemnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. He says, verse 32, when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. This is pretty strong. When he says, you partake of the communion in this unworthy fashion, you are eating and drinking your own judgment. Think about that. Pretty strong language. By not discerning the Lord's body. And of course, not just the bread. He's not just talking about the bread, the Lord's body, but he's talking about the body of Christ. The church body, the assembly, your brothers and sisters. He's talking about those that we fail to love perhaps because they're not just like us. Let me read a couple of other words here that I think we should pay very close attention to like the word sickness, the word chastisement, and the word death. In verse 30, he says, For this cause, for this cause, because many partake in such an unworthy manner, he says, For this cause, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, which means they're dead. Many are dead. For this cause, that's pretty strong, right? He says, verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened. There's the word chastisement. We're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. These petty squabbles, grudges, bickerings, contentions, schisms, divisions, uh, this idea of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hang with those or affiliate with those or talk to those or associate with those because they're not exactly like me. I, I want us to see how, how much God condemns this, how much God hates this, Amen. and how much harm it can do us. I mean, it hurts the whole body of Christ. But there's specific harm it does to us personally and individually. He says, for this reason, some of you are sick. For this reason, some of you are weak, feeble. And for this reason, some of you are already dead. Amen. Because of your failure to deal with your own self, to judge yourself, and that brings me to another word I'd like for us to consider tonight. And that's this word, self-examination. Verse 28. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I, I believe it's healthy for every Christian to... Consider themselves honestly in the light of Scripture. A good dose of self-examination. It's healthy for us all. Uh, the medical profession has announced that there are certain kinds of sicknesses that their scans don't catch and x-rays don't catch, or at least they don't catch them all the time, and that certain things are best discovered by self-examination. Isn't that interesting? Because there's a spiritual application here. <laughs> Let everybody examine himself. This means don't examine your wife. Or don't examine your husband. Or don't examine the brother next to you or the sister or that one or this one. You examine, wait, himself. 
Let a man examine himself. Take a look within at your own self. All right. Rusty, is there any strife here? Is there division here? Is there people that I just won't go hug in the church? Is there people that I just stay away from because I don't like them? I have to. Ask, you have to ask yourself this now. Is there somebody you haven't forgiven? Is there somebody that you keep your distance from because maybe they're a different color than you? Or because you think that they're beneath you socially? See, being from Chalmette does have its advantages. Because you can't look at anybody as being beneath you socially. <laughs> Everything is a climb up from there. You know. No, I'm just teasing. You know that. It's, uh, all my Shalmatian brothers and sisters, we love them in the Lord. Here's what Paul prescribes. Good, healthy dose of self-examination. Let a man examine himself. Have you asked the Lord to forgive you for the bias, for the prejudice, for the dislike, for the strife, for the contention, for the disharmony, for the lack of biblical love? Especially in light of the communion. Now, when we take communion together, do not think that this is just, you know, first Sunday of the month. That's just what we do in the first Sunday of the month. No, it's a memorial. It's a remembrance. It came by direct revelation. And this revelation declared that this is a proclamation of what Christ did, what this cup represents, what this bread represents, and also the fact that he's coming back and that sacrifice has made all men equals. All men. All women equals. Every one of us. In the fellowship, I think it's very healthy if we look to be with those that we don't get to be with very often. I think it's healthy when we look to fellowship with people we don't get to often fellowship with. Maybe they live on the other side of town from you. Maybe you don't get to see them all that often. I think it's healthy when we don't stay with the same little group all the time in our fellowship. That, that we do fellowship with one another. One with another. All as equals. 2 Corinthians 13.5, examine yourselves, Paul says, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. There's a couple of other really important words here uh, this morning that, that are worth mentioning, like covenant. This word, covenant, agreement. This, this is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood covenant together we're, we're covenanted covenanted with the Lord through the sacrifice that he made and actually with each other as well as brothers and sisters and of course thanksgiving we're always to be a thankful people a praising people a rejoicing people so there are some really good key words here that help us to understand a little bit more about what the Lord's Supper actually is supposed to be. Amen. What it's supposed to be. So when we partake of it, <clears throat> it's not just a neat time to eat uh, a little grape juice and a cracker. There is a powerful symbolism here. Uh, you think of it as this divinely instituted memorial whereby we stop, we remember that this, this really is about you, Lord. It's about you. It's not about me, what I'm going through, my feelings, my hurts, <clears throat> my trials, my afflictions. But it's about you. What you did 
what you did for me. How thankful I should be. How thankful I should be that I have this fellowship of brothers and sisters. That there are hands I can shake and hugs, necks I can hug. (laughs) I just read yesterday that in the world, every 11 minutes, a Christian is killed for their faith. Every 11 minutes. Every 11 minutes, another Christian is killed for their faith. That's the uh, current statistic worldwide. So many, so many all over the world, our brothers and sisters do not have the opportunity to fellowship like you and I have. To come together, to love on each other, to appreciate each other, to be exhorted together, to pray together. What a blessing it is. It's a blessing and a privilege that we have that we must not take for granted. Remember, let's remember that while we have these freedoms, there are many others of us in the world that do not. Let a man examine himself. And then you can eat that bread and and drink that cup. And, and, And do it thankfully. Father, I pray today that you will help us one and all to recognize the profound, the profound imagery, the symbolism, the significance in the Lord's Supper, in the communion of the bread and cup that we partake of together. Help us, Lord Jesus, to keep this close in our minds and hearts, to never let this deteriorate into mere ritual. And Father, as we partake of it in the future, every time, let us remember it is also a declaration. You died and you're coming back. We we pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.